Welcome back to Wardcast, guys. Hope you are doing well out there. I'm your host, Ward, as always. And in this video, we're going to be talking about and breaking down the latest filing by Jack Smith's team in the U.S. versus Trump case from D.C. So I've done many videos on this particular case, and uh, I've read every single paper that's been filed by Jack Smith's team. And as far as this one goes, there's a lot, there's a mountain of evidence that's presented here. And if this case ever goes to trial, which it will next year, he's going to prison. Okay, there's no doubt about it. The evidence is solid. I'm giving you 100% guarantee, as I've done since last year uh, when he was indicted, he will be convicted on this. Now, this paper does have some legal issue, one legal issue, really. There's only really one legal issue. And uh, that we're going to talk about that. And that has to do with Mike Pence. I'm more convinced by Jack Smith's team's argument now than I was a week ago. So he's they're making progress with me because this is a no, this is all new, by the way. OK, after the Supreme Court's um, decision on immunity, this is all new stuff. This has never happened before. There's never been a president like a, a former president that's been charged with crimes like this before. So this is all new and we're figuring things out out as we go along okay so i'm gonna explain that particular part um and uh, the another problem that i had with this uh, document it, it's a logistical one it's not nothing to do with the legal content but the way they presented this is very disjointed and this document is way too long they could have streamlined this a lot i'm a trained legal person i was reading this and it took forever Be and there's so much repetition the the introduction section is way too long and they present part of the evidence here here, and then again, they present it in the middle of the, the paper where all the meat is supposed to be. And then they repeat it way too much go, uh, going through to the end. So this should have been like maybe 90 pages. They should they could have screen, streamlined this way more and made it very uh, much easier to read. If a lay person reads this, they're going to be confused. OK, uh, I understood what was going on because I understand the law. But nevertheless, if somebody who doesn't understand the law, like a regular person off the street reads this, they're going to be it's going to be very hard to get through. OK, even if they're a fast reader. So just so I had so basically two problems. I think bringing Mike Pence into this just complicates things. I think that was a mistake. And the the, the structure of how they decide to lay this out seems like it wasn't well thought out. OK, because I've read every single other thing published by Jack Smith's legal team and the prosecutors. And it, it was great and a pleasure to read. Honestly, I loved reading those uh, legal documents with good arguments. But this one was very disjointed and repetitive. So I think they could have improved on that. So I'm going to criticize everybody on my channel, whether I like them or not, it doesn't matter. I'm always going to give you guys the, the facts about the law and my what I thought was good or bad. OK, so the, the legal papers content content was good. The layout was horrible. Okay, just got to be honest. And Donald Trump is going to prison if this case ever goes to trial. And that's that's the, the summary here. So I'm not going to cover all the uh, there's no way for me to cover all the evidence laid out here, but I'm going to summarize for you the most important things. Um, we're going to cover we're going to cover Arizona and what Trump did in Arizona. They lay out in detail in the Arizona section, what Trump and his co-conspirators did. And it is damning. OK, if this like I said, if this ever goes to trial, which it will, he is going to prison uh, along with Giuliani, who's also here, obviously. So we're going to cover Arizona here and I'm going to we're going to read through it. We're going to read through most of this and, because it's important and it's an example of all the other states. So after Arizona, they go into Pennsylvania, they go into Georgia. I'm not going to go through all the states. Essentially, they did the, the same thing. They tried to interfere with the certification of the vote at the state level, which is where it's supposed to happen. According to the Constitution, the federal government and the president has nothing to do with counting the votes. And he and his co-conspirators clearly interfere with the uh, the process of counting the electoral votes, which is a crime. Okay, the defendant asserts that he is immune from prosecution for his criminal scheme uh, to overturn the 2020 presidential election because he claims it entitled it entailed official conduct. Not so. Although the defendant was the incumbent president during the charged conspiracies, his schemes his scheme was fundamentally a private one, working with a team of private co-conspirators, the defendant acted as a candidate when he pursued multiple criminal schemes to disrupt through fraud and deceit the government function by which votes are collected and counted, a function in which the defendant as president had no official role. When the defendant lost the 2020 presidential election, he resorted to crimes to try to stay in office. With private co-conspirators, the defendant launched a series of uh, 
a series of increasingly desperate plans to overturn the legitimate election results in seven states that he lost, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So we're going to go through Arizona, which is like a carbon copy of what he tried to do in other states. Small differences here and there, but basically he tried to get Republicans in the state to try to overturn the, the electoral count. That's essentially what he did, though that's a crime, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so here are the three conspiracies that that the government claims that he engaged in. OK, conspiracy number one, a conspiracy to interfere with the federal government function by which the uh, nation collects and counts election election results, uh, which is set forth in the Constitution and the Electoral Count Act. I've said, you know, I've said he violated the Electoral Count Act of 1887 like a thousand times on my channel, and that's what he's talking about here. The 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act lay out the transfer of power from one administration to the other. Since 1804, when John Adams lost to Thomas Jefferson, that's how we've done it. OK, and he violated both of those things. Uh, the Electoral Count Act obviously came later. Uh, the 12th Amendment was passed in 1804 uh, when there was problems with John Adams and, and uh, Thomas Jefferson. They were, you know, heavy political rivals, personal friends. But in politics, they disagreed. One was a Democratic Republican. That's Thomas Jefferson. And uh, John Adams, my man, was a Federalist. OK, and they did not agree on a whole, whole host of things. And they had a very bitter rivalry. Conspiracy to obstruct the official proceeding in which Congress certifies, this is a scheme too, conspiracy two, a conspiracy to obstruct the official proceeding in which Congress certifies the legitimate results of the presidential election, and conspiracy three, a conspiracy against the rights of millions of Americans to have their votes counted. And that, that's, that has to do with what he did in the states, trying to overturn the proper electoral count so that, that his electors, his fake electors, can be counted instead delegitimizing the votes of all the people who voted for Joe Biden. That's what that's what the third conspiracy is about. So that's what the four criminal charges have to do with these three conspiracies. Uh, the defendant also relied heavily on private agents uh, such as his campaign employees and volunteers like campaign ma the campaign manager, person two, deputy campaign manager, person three, senior campaign advisor, person four, I believe that Steve Bannon, one of these people are Steve Bannon. I, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to go through and try to figure out and campaign operative person five. Uh, so on November 4th, person five, a campaign employee, uh, agent and co-conspirator of Donald Trump tried to sow confusion when the ongoing vote count at the TCF center in Detroit, Michigan looked unfavorable for the defendant. So this is about Michigan. So it should be in the Mis Michigan section of this, but they put it in the beginning, in the intro section, when they're trying to lay out their basic summary this so this is what i'm talking about this should this belonged in the michigan section which is way down in the middle section where he explains where they explain his scheme in michigan that's where this belongs but they put it in the they put it in the beginning so it's very repetitive and it doesn't make any sense so at the tcf center told person five we think a batch of votes heavily in biden's favor is uh right person five responded that's a person who is a campaign employee for donald trump find a reason it isn't for biden this vote batch give me options to file litigation so they were looking for fake reasons to pretend like biden didn't get those votes uh and even if it's bs that's what uh it this means BS. Even if it's BS, find me a reason to file a lawsuit. That's a crime, by the way, uh, filing a false lawsuit if you're just a regular citizen. And even a lawyer, that's even worse. That's grounds for disbarment. If you know the facts are false and you're filing it anyways, ask John Eastman and Giuliani how that turned out for them. They, they're going to lose their bar license. Giuliani has already lost it. Their, his legal career is over because of this. When the colleagues suggested that there was about to be uh, unrest reminiscent of the uh, Brooks Brothers riot, that's during the Florida runoff uh, election in 2000, uh, Person 5 responded, make them riot. That's the Trump campaign employee. Do it. The defendants, campaign operatives and supporters use similar tactics at other tabulation centers, including in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. And the defendants sometimes use the resulting confrontations to falsely claim that his election observers were being denied proper access, thus serving as a pr uh, predicate to the defendant's claim that uh, fraud must have occurred in its observer absence observers absence so they would create unrest so they get kicked out by the police and they would claim and he would claim that all oh, my people are getting kicked out because they want to switch out the vo votes and ballots this is the, this is how he laid out the lies and the people who believe it were dumb enough or ignorant enough to actually believe his lies 
which shows that he has no respect for his followers. Though he's gonna straight lie straight to hit their faces just so he can try to stay in power. That's how disgusting Donald Trump is. He has no respect for you if you're a Trump supporter. Contrary to the defendant's public claims of victory immediately following the election day, his advisors informed him that he would likely lose on November 7th in a private campaign meeting that included person two, three, and four, and White House staffer person nine, who came to serve as a conduit for information for the campaign to the defendant. Campaign staff told the defendant, Donald Trump, that he had only a slim chance of prevailing in the election and that any potential success was contingent on the defendant winning all ongoing vote counts or litigation in Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Within a week of that assessment, on November 13th, the defendant's campaign conceded conceded its litigation in Arizona, meaning they admitted defeat, meaning that based on his campaign advisor's previous assessment, the defendant had lost the election. That same day, in an implicit acknowledgement that he had no lawful way to prevail, the defendant sidelined the existing campaign staff responsible for mounting his legal election challenges from person two and three and others who were telling the defendant the truth that he did not want to hear that he had lost. The defendant uh, turned to uh, co-conspirator one, that's Giuliani, a private attorney who was willing to um, falsify claim, a uh, falsely claim, excuse me, victory and uh, spread knowingly false claims of election fraud. CC1 is Giuliani, CC2 is John Eastman, just FYI. Um, uh, and the, he went to he went on to make phone calls and try to um, overturn the election. Again, they repeat things way too much here, um, so it's it's very hard to read. But uh, let's go to some more important stuff. The defendant and his co-conspirators also demonstrated their deliberate disregard for the truth and thus their knowing uh, knowledge of falsity when they repeatedly changed the numbers in their baseless fraud allegations from day to day. And this is a really good part. That's why I highlighted this. At trial, the government will introduce several instances of this pattern in which the defendant and the uh, co-conspirators uh, the conspirators' lies were proved by the fact that they made up figures from whole cloth. <laughs> One example concerns the defendant and co-conspirators or conspirators' claims about non-citizen voters in Arizona. The conspirators started with the allegation that 36,000 non-citizens voted in Arizona. Five days later, it was beyond, it was, quote, beyond credulity that a few hundred thousand didn't vote. Three weeks after that, uh, the bare minimum was 40 to 50,000. The reality is about 250,000. These are things that his uh, co-conspirators were saying, people like uh, Sidney Powell and Giuliani. Days after that, the assertion was 32,000. And ultimately, the conspirators landed back where they started at 36,000, a false figure that they never verified or corroborated. Ultimately, the defendant's steady stream of disinformation in the post-election period culminated in the speech he gave at a private funded privately organized rally at the ellipse on the morning of january 6 and we all know what happened after that so let's go to arizona this is important so i'm going to cover arizona which is basically an exemplar for all the states like georgia pennsylvania he did the same thing there so covering arizona covers everything basically at the general outline of everything he did, the types of actions that he took, which were criminal, by the way, everything in here is a crime. That's why uh, he's getting prosecuted. The defendant was on notice that there was no evidence of widespread election fraud in Arizona within weeks of the election. On November 9th, for instance, two days after news networks projected that Biden had won, the defendant called the Arizona governor, person 16, to ask him what was happening at a state level in the presidential election in Arizona. At that point, uh, though Fox News had projected that Biden had won the state, several other outlets like ABC News, NBC News, etc. had not yet yet made a projection. Person 16, the governor, walked the defendant through the margins and the votes remaining to be counted, which were primarily from Pima County, which favored Biden and Maricopa County, which was split. Person 16 described the situation to the defendant as the ninth inning, two outs, and the defendant was several runs down, which means you're likely going to lose. That was That's the reason that he used that baseball metaphor. The defendant also raised claims of election fraud and person 16 asked the defendant to send him supporting evidence. Although the defendant said he would, Trump said he'd send the evidence of election fraud, um, stating we're packing it, we're packaging it up. 
He never did. He never sent the package, even though they were packing it up. Shortly, uh, shortly thereafter, on November seventh, the uh, thirteenth, excuse me, campaign manager person two uh, told the defendant directly that a false fraud claim uh, that had been circulating that a substantial number of non-citizens had voted in Arizona was false. That's one of his own people telling him that. The same day, as noted previously, campaign attorneys conceded in court that the remaining election lawsuit in Arizona was moot. The defendant and co-conspirator one, that's uh, Giuliani, continued to try to influence person 16, that's the Arizona governor, okay? <clears throat> Um, they tried to influence the governor. For example, Giuliani tried to contact the governor on November 22nd, the same day the defendant had Giuliani reach out to the Arizona Speaker of the House, as described below. And on November 30th, 30th um, person 16 signed the Arizona Certificate of uh, Ascertainment, formally declaring Biden's electors as the legitimate electors for Arizona. The governor received a call from the defendant and Pence. Uh, the governor advised them that Arizona had certified the election. When the defendant brought up fraud claims, the governor was eager to see the evidence. Again, asked the defendant to provide it, but the defendant never did. Instead, later that evening and into the following morning, the defendant repeatedly publicly attacked the governor on Twitter, retweeting posts by others such as, who needs Democrats when you have Republicans like uh, like the governor? My state ran the most corrupt election in American history. Hold my beer. And why is the governor of Arizona still pretending he's a member of the Republican Party after he just certified the fraudulent, uh, re certified fraudulent election results in Arizona that disenfranchised millions of Republicans? So as soon as you don't bend to the will of Giuliani and Trump, they call you a rhino and say you're not a real Republican. This is the way they roll. If you're not willing to commit crimes for them, then you're not a good enough Republican. Okay, that's how it works with them. The defendant and co-conspirator also co-conspirators also attempted to use false fraud claims to convince political allies in Arizona state legislature to ignore the popular vote and appoint illegitimate electors. On November 22nd, the defendant and uh, Giuliani called uh, PA. Uh, Person 18, that's um, that's uh, Rusty Bowers, I believe, the Speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives. Giuliani did most of the talking. During the call, the defendant and Giuliani levied multiple false fraud claims, including of non-citizens, non-residents, and dead voters that affected the defendant's race, and asked Bowers to use them as a basis to call the state legislature in into session to replace Arizona's legitimate electors with illegitimate ones. That's a violation of the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act. That's a federal crime right there. Okay, the, like directly. All this is a all this is criminal, but that's a very specific violation of the Electoral Count Act, which requires that the states to choose those electors, and nobody else should be trying to tell them to overturn it or attempting to influence them and try to overturn uh, the already certified electors. Okay, you, this this is specifically prohibited under the Electoral Count Act. So that's a specific federal crime there. That's like th that a jury is going to buy like that because it's so easy to prove. OK, it's all on record. <clears throat> <clears throat> When uh, Rusty Bauer voiced his deep skepticism, Giuliani said, well, you know, we're all kind of Republicans and we need to be working together. Yeah, let's all, you know, we're all Republican criminals. Let's all work together to overturn the election. <laughs> and Bowers refused and asked uh, Giuliani to provide evidence supporting his fraud, fraud claims. And Giuliani never did. What a surprise. He still has them, by the way. Still waiting. Still waiting for that bombshell. Indeed, Giuliani met with Bowers in person approximately a week later and still had nothing to back up his claim. Hmm, golly gee willikers. And on November 13th, um, Giuliani and person 12 and others arrived in Arizona for a hotel hearing, an unofficial meeting with Republican legislators during which they promoted false fraud allegations. In a meeting the day after the hearing, when state legislators, legislators pressed Giuliani and person 12 for evidence to support their claims. Giuliani conceded that even on that late date, we don't have the evidence we have, but we have lots of theories. <laughs> no evidence, but theories, yes. 
when the legislators were frustrated that Giuliani had no support for his claims and asked him tough questions, Giuliani expressed surprise at the way he was being treated, stating, quote, man, I thought we were all Republicans. This is a little more hostile a reception. I'm amazed at the reception I'm getting here. So he wants to overturn the election, but he doesn't want to provide evidence. And it was right that the Republican uh, state legislators here did their job and asked for evidence of fraud if he has any, which he did not present because there is no, there was no fraud. On December 8th, person 18, the Rusty Bowers released a public statement in which he explained that he did not have the authority to use the legislature to reverse the results of the election and that doing so would constitute an attempt to nullify the people's vote based on unsupported theories of fraud. Uh, Rusty Bowers made clear that he was disappointed with the legitimate, uh, legitimate election results because he voted for President Trump and worked hard to re-elect him, but would not violate current law to change the outcome of the certified election. On Twitter, uh, Person19, a campaign staffer who worked with uh, co-conspirator 6, attacked Rusty Bowers for, his sta for this statement, uh, writing that uh, Bowers is intentionally misleading the people of Arizona to avoid uh, the inevitable. The defendant retweeted, uh, Donald Trump retweeted Person 19's false post and praised her. A month later, just two days before January 6, uh, co-conspirator 2, that's uh, John Eastman, another of the defendant's private attorneys and co-conspirators, called Rusty Bowers uh, and Rusty Bowers' lawyer um, and urged Rusty Bowers one last time to use the le legislature to decertify Arizona's legitimate electors and overturn the valid election results. And this is why uh, John Eastman is getting his ass disbarred very soon. He's already been suspended, and the California Supreme Court, I'm telling you right now, is going to disbar his ass, especially after this. Okay, especially after this. <clears throat> There's no way to survive. He's going to be like Giuliani without a job as a lawyer. <clears throat> when uh, Rusty Bowers told uh, co-conspirator 2, that's um, John Eastman, that there was no evidence of su substantial fraud in Arizona and that he would not legally call the legislator into legislature into session, uh, uh, um, John Eastman was undeterred. He conceded that he didn't know enough about the facts on the ground in Arizona regarding fraud in Arizona and said that Rusty Bauer should nonetheless falsely claim that he had the authority to convene the legislature and let the court sort it out. Oh, that sounds real legal, bro. This guy's supposed to be a brilliant legal scholar, John Eastman. He's freaking retarded. He has no idea what he's talking about. He's an idiot. Okay. <clears throat> In the post-election period, uh, Rusty Bowers was harassed on several occasions. Individuals gathered outside his house with bullhorns and screamed and ho uh, honked their vehicle horns to create noise. Once, the, once an individual in visible possession of a pistol and wearing a t-shirt in support of a militia group came onto Rusty Bowers' property and screamed at him. At the time of these events, Rusty Bowers' daughter was at home and was ill and the noise caused her disruption and angst. So that's that's somewhat of a complete picture of what happened there. The prosecutors will have exhibits and videos and pictures to go along with this at trial when they present the case. But that is an example of the types of things that Trump and his uh, lawyers and co-conspirators did. OK, that's one example. Georgia is similar where they tried to influence Kemp and the Georgia legislature to overturn the election there. OK, so we're not going to go over it, but essentially Arizona is a, uh, a framework and a, and a summarized plan of what they did in all the other states that that they uh, explain here. And the same thing in Michigan. OK. So I'm not going to go over every state because it's the same model that they used, uh, but I do want to go over um, what he said about um, Sidney Powell, where he called them crazy, uh, despite the fact that he himself went on to push her conspiracy theories despite calling them crazy. The defendant saw his private attorney's RNC press conference, that's Giuliani and Sidney Powell in that, the famous one where all the pictures are from, you guys know what I'm talking about, uh, when, where Jenna Ellis was there, Giuliani was there, and Sidney Powell was there, that's the Kraken uh, press conference that everybody talks about. Okay, That's what they're talking about here. Uh, the defendant saw that press conference, acknowledged to person four that CC3, that's uh, co-conspirator thir uh, three, Sidney Powell, had appeared unhinged in the press conference. 
Um, and on November 20th, the day after the press conference, the defendant made a similar comment to person seven and person 45, two White House staffers who also volunteered for his campaign. In casual conversation after another meeting had ended, the defendant told person seven and 45 that person 51 had eviscerated or destroyed Sidney Powell. And person 51 is Tucker Carlson, where he had that segment where he said, I told Sidney Powell to bring evidence of election fraud to our show, and she didn't do it. Okay. And so, uh, so that's what he's referring to there. He was admitting to his, to the pe people in his campaign around him that Tucker Carlson had eviscerated Sidney Powell and her ridiculous claims about how you know uh, uh, Hugo Chavez and the Venezuelans had stolen the election through Dominion. Uh, yeah, d ridiculous. The defendant then had a call with uh, Sidney Powell on speakerphone while person seven and forty five listened in and mentioned that. Person 55 uh, segment to uh, Sidney Powell, meaning about Tucker Carlson eviscerating her. While um, Sidney Powell responded, the defendant placed the call on mute and to person 7 and 45, mocked and laughed at Sidney Powell, called her claims crazy, and made a reference to the science fiction series Star Trek when describing her allegations. So the, Trump thought that Sidney Powell was a lunatic and that Tucker Carlson had destroyed her claims. <laughs> Yet, you'll see that he went on to push them nevertheless. In the same time period, when person nine told Trump that Sidney Powell's claims were unreliable and should not be involved in lawsuits, the defendant agreed that uh, he had not seen anything to substantiate Sidney Powell's allegations. And uh, also, um, the Giuliani then went on to distance Sidney Powell from their lawsuits saying that she's not, she's practicing law on her own personal capacity and does not represent the president because that's how crazy Sidney Powell was uh, where even Giuliani and Trump thought that she was a lunatic. Nonetheless, the defendant continued to support and publicize Sidney Powell's knowingly false claims. For example, within days of Giuliani's statement distancing himself and Trump from uh, Sidney Powell, the defendant promoted a lawsuit that Sidney Powell was about to file, tweeting on November 24th, breaking news, at Sidney Powell says her lawsuit in Georgia could be filed as soon as tomorrow, and, and uh, says there's no way there was anything but widespread election fraud. Okay, so that's him knowingly supporting and pushing out to his audience claims that he thought were out of Star Trek, but nevertheless pushing them on his Twitter. Again, showing nothing but disrespect for his own voters who uh, believe everything that comes out of his uh, ugly ass mouth, lying mouth. But nevertheless, this is how he treats them. Okay, and by the way, this is part of the reason that uh, Fox News was sued. This this was this was one of the times that they let on, on Dobbs show. Um, what's his name? Lou Dobbs let this lunatic uh, Powell on his show to claim these things against Dominion. And guess what that ended in? A $767 million settlement that Fox had to do with Dominion because of the lies that they allowed to be promoted on their uh, on their airwaves. The defendant's inter interaction with Pence. The Supreme Court stated that whenever the president and the vice president discusses their official responsibilities, they engage in official conduct and further uh, and further explain that because Pence's role uh, at the certification was a constitutional and statutory duty of the vice president, the defendant was at least presumptively immune from prosecution for such conduct. Okay, so that's what the Supreme Court said. And generally, I agree with that. If it's official conduct, especially if it's in the Constitution, then yes, there is immunity for the president, just like Congress and the judiciary have also have immunity in certain matters. In order for there to be three equal branches of government, they have to be immune to do their job. Otherwise, they're going to be attacked by the other branches. So immunity is a fundamental part of the government in America, the Constitution. Prosecutors like Jack Smith are going to get attacked. Uh, you'll notice that he he is still on the case, despite the fact that Congress people like Jim Jordan and Ted Cruz tried to attack Jack Smith and get him off the case. But did they? No, because Jack Smith has immunity as a prosecutor, and there's nothing Congress people can get, do against him. He's responsible for administrating the law and for prosecuting this case, not Jim Jordan. Okay, so. Immunity goes around for everybody. Bernie Sanders has immunity. Congress people, AOC has immunity. You say whatever crazy shit she wants about people and she can't get sued because she has the speech and debate clause to protect her. Every, all three of the branches of the government have immunities built in so they can be protected from potential attacks by other branches. 
Okay, this is the way that the founding fathers built things so that we can have three strong branches of government that can do things. Otherwise, they just be constantly fighting each other instead of doing that. There's some infighting still, but it's not as bad as it would be if there was no immunity. So immunity is not a crazy thing. For official duties, there has to be immunity to make sure that we can actually get things done. But certainly for private criminal acts, there is no immunity for anybody, for Congress people, for the president, for judges, they're not protected, okay? The government intends to introduce at trial evidence regarding conversations between the defendant and Pence in which they did not discuss Pence's, Pence's official responsibilities as president of the Senate and instead acted in their private capacities as running mates. And the government intends to elicit at trial evidence about uh, Pence staffers' conversations with co-conspirator 2, that's, um, that's John Eastman. Those conversations were unofficial and therefore not immune. That's true. This Pence staffer talking to uh, John Eastman, John Eastman is not an executive branch employee, so that's totally valid. The Supreme Court held that discussions between the defendant and Pence concerning Pence's role of certifying uh, the uh, the proceed the the January 6th proceedings qualifies as official conduct and therefore subject to rebuttable uh, presumption of immunity because they involved official actions between the president and the uh, vice president, their official responsibilities. Those discussions qualify as official because the uh, presiding over the January 6th certification proceeding at which members of Congress count the electoral vote votes is a constitutional and statutory duty of the vice president. That's what they said. The discussions at issue did not pertain to Pence's role as president of the Senate writ large. However, instead, focused only on his discrete duties in presiding over the certification proceeding, a process in which the executive branch, by design, plays no, uh, no direct role. Okay, now that is true. A prosecution involving the defendant's efforts to influence Pence in the discharge of his uh, of this particular duty housed in the legislative branch would not pose any danger of intrusion on the authority and the functions of the executive branch. So what they're saying is that they were private running mates that's what they that's what he said here and also this what he was what pence was doing and what trump was trying to influence was not official conduct uh, not excuse me was not something that the executive branch should be involved in because their their argument is that uh, mike pence was acting as part of the legislative branch that day not as part of the executive branch okay that's what uh, that's what Jack Smith is saying here. That's the differentiation that he's making, that Pence was acting as a member of the legislative branch on that day, and therefore Trump had no right and no immunity to try to interfere with that conduct because the Supreme Court said he's protected for official duties inside the executive branch, which the president has a right to do. And that's true. Since George Washington times, the the core constitutional acts of the president have been immune from prosecution. That's true, okay? Because, though, because you can't possibly commit a crime while you're doing that stuff. Like, like it's hard to imagine a crime, okay? And and it makes sense to protect those actions because the president's uh, power has to be protected. You can't let the other branches uh, interfere with that. So it makes sense. Uh, but what Trump did, he's arguing, was not having anything to do with the executive branch. He was trying to interfere with legislative work on January 6th. That's the argument. Again, that's a 50-50 proposition, I would say, because you can still argue, no, Pence was still, uh, you know, uh, still uh, part of the executive branch because he was still the vice president. Just because you're acting that day as the president of the Senate doesn't mean that you're not still the vice president. Trump's side will make that argument and the Supreme Court might buy it. So this is why it's so dangerous to take a chance, uh, you know, bringing Pence into this case at all. When you have a mountain of other evidence of crimes committed by him and Giuliani and, and other people at a state level where they have no immunity, why bring Mike Pence into it and complicate the situation? Even if you have a chance of winning, you're you're risking this case drag on more into appeals court by doing this stuff. So. I don't think it's a good idea to involve Pence in this, no matter what salacious stuff has come out about, you know, what he, how he wanted the mob to kill Pence and he didn't care. That's also here, by the way. He said, so what, when Pence was about, about to be hung by the crowd. So, yeah. Anyways, let, let's get to the Constitution. The last thing I want to cover. The executive branch has no authority or function to choose the next president. True. To the contrary, the Constitution provides that the states will appoint electors to vote for the president and the vice president. That's the U.S. Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. And all states have chosen 
and all states have chosen to make such appointments based on the ballots cast by the people in the respective states. The quote, the Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their vote. That's the U.S. Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 4. But the executive branch has no dis uh, direct role in that process. So you guys understand what's happening here. The states are the federal elections for president and vice president are run by the states. The, Donald Trump and the executive branch have no involvement in uh, in choosing the next president and the vice president for good reason. If he's the incumbent, then he can't possibly have control over the election because some corrupt people might try to make themselves win again. <clears throat> Uh, I think you know who I'm talking about. So for that reason, the executive branch has nothing to do with counting the vote. It's all up to the states. And if you try to interfere with that, that's a crime. OK, that's it. And they go on further to explain other things. But you guys get where Jack Smith is coming from. So like I said, this document could have been written better. But nevertheless, when it comes to the evidence at the state level in Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, it's solid evidence that's going to put Trump in prison bringing Mike Pence into this is a big mistake. You don't need to do that in order to make a solid case. So I'm I'm disappointed that Jack Smith is still uh, pursuing that because you have a chance of losing there. And this case being dragged through the appeals court and ultimately to the Supreme Court even more. It's going to go up to the trial court. Then it's going to go to the DC appeals court. Then it's going to go to the Supreme Court. So it's going to be it's going to take longer to put him on trial if you follow if you try to go with this Pence thing because Pence can still be considered an executive branch employee and therefore he is his whatever whatever Trump talked about with him could be considered to be a privilege so why even why even try to pursue that you don't need Mike Pence to win this trial you have a mountain of other evidence from the states that would destroy Trump at trial and put him in prison for a long time so Jack Smith is making a big mistake in my opinion even taking a risk trying to present this Mike Pence Pence crap at the trial you when you don't need it he doesn't need it to win the case so I think it's a big mistake but nevertheless I'm not the prosecutor and we'll see how things go I'll be covering it further as we go forward here the content is good the arguments are good the evidence is good I just wish it was written better but that's what it is that's all I got to say for this video hope you guys got something out of my analysis and as always I'll see you guys in my next one